history of traditional schools started 120 years ago, and it's very dated. I wouldn't want to drive a car 120 years ago. I wouldn't want to have surgery done 120 years ago. So I don't want to teach kids like they did 120 years ago. We know more about how the brain works. We know more about how learners learn. The redesign was a no-brainer for me. In 2015, the Kansas State Department of Education traveled across the state convening community conversations made up of family, business, and community partners, as well as educators, to see what they wanted to see in successful high school graduates and what role K-12 schools should play in developing youth. From this tour, we gathered thousands of responses to help create the Kansans Can School Redesign Model. Kansas Redesign focuses on four principles student success skills, community partnerships, real-world application, and personalized learning. Starting with just seven school districts and 14 schools, Redesign has grown to over 190 schools in 71 districts, doing incredible work. The journey has not been easy, but schools will tell you it has been worth it. Join us as we share six of these compelling Redesign stories. The greatest asset of Dighton and Lane County is its people. That's what drew a lot of people to this place in the first place, and it's what uh, keeps a lot of us anchored here. Unfortunately, we're seeing a depopulation trend that's not at all unique to us. It's pretty prevalent throughout rural Kansas. It makes it difficult to continue to provide public services, even the educational system itself. As you shrink in population, do you have adequate teachers and personnel to take care of the kids that are still there. Our economy is based on agriculture almost entirely, crops and cattle, that's what we do. Our whole county only has about 258 people. About 600 of those, 650 of those live in, in the city limits. Part of the school redesign that we did was to hopefully build a program that would actually draw families here because of our education system was so good and hopefully that would draw businesses to Dighton. Prior to redesign, I think that we were doing our best based on, I guess, what we knew at the time. I think that our kids were not challenged. I had so much frustration within my own classroom because I would come in and I would do all this prep work and I would work so hard and my students weren't engaged. And I never considered doing something else, but I just kept thinking, I need to do better. I have to do better. What different things can I do? We kind of ripped the Band-Aid off. We did three monumental changes after one year of research. So we changed our traditional 45-minute class period day to a flex mod schedule where kids, every day looks different for every kid, for every teacher. We have Summit 7 through 9, and then we have a PBL Academy in addition to um, a traditional track in grades 10 through 12. And so there were really big changes that happened, but we felt like we had good reasoning behind all those changes. We wanted Summit in 7 through 9 because we wanted those good foundational skills. We felt like the rigor was there, we knew the lessons were high quality, and we knew that there was a heavy emphasis on habits of success. Kids would learn how they learn best, they would learn self-advocacy, they would learn how to manage their time, and that really provides the structure for our staff to teach those things because we can think about teaching those things instead of thinking about how can I best teach my student photosynthesis. I mean, if anyone's ever taught photosynthesis, you think it's simple. It's not simple. I think with project-based learning and what we're doing in our academy, we really wanted to empower students to explore things that they were interested in while meeting the standards. And if you're in my traditional English class, I'm gonna tell you how we're gonna meet this standard as a whole group. But when they get into the Project Based Learning Academy, they can decide. And then at the end, they have to make this final product. We're really encouraging them to learn a new skill, build something they're proud of. And sometimes they're not that great, but they worked really hard on it and they're really proud of it and that's okay. And there's just a lot of executive function happening in that room that people don't necessarily get. Instead of me saying, 
we're gonna read this book, we're gonna write this thing, we're gonna do blah, blah, blah. They say, I wanna read this book. I'm really interested in learning how to crochet, so I'm gonna crochet a creature out of this book that I've read. Why can't they do that and meet some literature standards and some art standards? They can't, and why wouldn't we let them if they were excited about it? Project-based learning today is an entire process and it starts with day one and we're not just doing a project in the end. We're research and learning as we go. We're incorporating all the areas of reading, math, science, social studies in one big to-do. Kids don't look at it as, oh yeah, today I'm learning this. No, they're just doing, but as they're doing, they're taking all of that in. So when you go have a conversation with them, they're gonna say, well, my solar panel didn't work because I couldn't figure out why I couldn't connect. But as they work through those things, all that knowledge is embedded. So they can talk to you about it versus, you know, I wrote it down once and I walked away and okay, I'm done now. We started the year end, we were talking a lot about COVID-19. That kind of led into a discussion of, you know, why are people choosing to not live in big cities? And so it all kind of worked together. So I came up with how could you live efficiently and effectively off the grid? Well, then that led into, well, what does that mean off the grid? So they're working on a project living off the grid. We incorporated math through area and perimeter, and they had to choose certain crops and certain animals and what kind of dwelling will you have? So a lot of research went into it up front. Now they're actually building a model of, and how are you going to supply the energy that you need? A fun part of that is we've talked a lot about water and, and how are you going to get water and what will you need water for? Well, they're all gonna haul water. So my goal here is we're really gonna haul water. Project-based learning involves so much creativity and it allows those kids to excel when they get to do their thing. We're about to finish up with models, and so now we have some questions to reflect on what did you do and why did you do it and how could you have better done it. Every year our numbers grow in our PBL Academy. Students are understanding, hey, I have an interest in this and I can develop it, and they're learning to take the lead on here are standards, here are power standards, here's what I need to know. And with some guidance and a, a framework that they do their research in, they then can create almost their own electives if they choose just to see them make it their own and what they can come out of it with has just been amazing. The whole purpose of PBL is to personalize learning for people. The main problem that we saw was that students didn't care about what they were learning. I've been really passionate about English and being able to do PBL I would never want to take a traditional English class ever again in a million years. I like PBL too much because it gives you so much freedom. It let me realize, hey, I do really like writing. I do maybe want to go forward with this in my life. It involves the kids and the thing that they're learning. It makes learning closer to them. Learning feels more personal when you're teaching yourself in PBL or you're doing projects you care about. I was taking a PBL in a science class, and I could put art in those things as much as I wanted, so I tried to do that. It made chemistry a lot more fun because I did not want to be taking chemistry, but if I could do art projects about it, it was easier to learn about it. Project-based learning has been a huge thing that my kids have really grabbed hold of and enjoyed. It allows them to utilize creativity. It also allows them to focus in on something that they are passionate about and then engage that passion in a bunch of areas that touch on their curriculum and they don't even realize it. That means a lot to me and that can look very different for each student. Even with three kids, they're all three very different. To see each of them now go through some of the same grade levels and classes and learn in the way that serves them well has been very rewarding for me. He was happy about King, of course. What we were seeing in K2, every year I would have kids who were above and beyond reading level. I'm a second grade teacher, I had kids who were reading fourth and fifth grade reading level. But at the very same time, I would have kids who were lacking kindergarten and first grade skills. And when you have this giant gap to teach to the whole group, we knew that that was a waste of most of the kids' time. Either they already knew it or it was way too advanced for them. 
So you're really only teaching to the average. We started looking around and we actually found um, Pathways to Reading, which is a phonics program that we use. And that really showed us how to do some small group focus for um, phonics and reading and comprehension. Now we just take all of our K2 kids in that program and we're looking at where do they fall on that spectrum of reading and we group them according to the skills that they're still lacking, which means that even the kids who have surpassed where they need to be, we're still finding out where they're at and pushing them on. Or kids who are not getting it, we're going back and covering the things that they need. And that's all done in small groups. And it's not just second graders with second graders. Summit Learning is composed of four classes, science, social studies, English, and math. Summit is actually just a platform that houses curriculum. We've had teachers upload their own curriculum into certain sections of their subject. Students are provided with personalized learning time where they then learn to develop specific habits. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about what Summit is and how Summit works. And just to kind of unpack that, it is housed online, but not everything we do is online in Summit Learning. If you can imagine taking the best teacher that you can imagine and turning that into a software platform that allows you to have all the tools you need to do really great lessons, to track data for students, that's what Summit Learning is. I think the biggest problem that schools have seen is if you don't implement Summit correctly, that it can be a handful and it can be problematic. Kids can work at their own pace and not everybody learns at the same speed. Some kids move much quicker and some don't master the skills as, as fast as the others. So everybody's kind of in a different place, but always the opportunity to go back and master and relearn some of those cognitive skills. One of the biggest things that Redesign is doing for my kids, it's creating in them a personal responsibility that I think has been lacking. We use a summit program in our junior high. I have a daughter who's a seventh grader and she started out not really liking Summit because she didn't know what to do with it. She didn't know how to navigate it. And she didn't quite like that nobody was spoon feeding her. She's now completely on board with Summit. She loves it. It's a platform that she thinks is amazing and she has taken hold of that personal responsibility and just growing with it. And so seeing things like that working out in real life in my own home, it's huge. Being a teacher, I spend eight hours a day with my students. I'm deeply invested in their learning, but I'm also deeply invested in their character and their overall well-being. When I was here as a student 30 years ago, the world was a different place. Teachers have had to take those challenges on in addition to trying to educate students. What's driven this process so much of what's gone on is just looking at students individually. I think the social emotional aspect of this is kind of like the uh, 800 pound gorilla in the schoolroom that nobody wants to talk about. I think as a culture, we don't want to have that discussion. That's something that the redesign process has taken head on hasn't always been popular, it hasn't always been easy. I think if you asked our kids, are they happier now than they were before the redesign? Do they feel better about being here? Are they more comfortable at school? I would say absolutely. I think there's data to prove that, and I have uh, anecdotal information that I could give every day about things that we see with the social-emotional health of our kids and how that's improved. Just this year, we hired a fully licensed mental health counselor She's a licensed social worker. She can do screenings, whatever we need to do. So we thought social emotional was important enough that we put that as a huge priority for our district. Another part of the social emotional learning is through Summit and just grades 10 through 12. Every child is mentored in this building and they have an adult that they meet with once a week, not just to discuss academics, but just life in general. You know, what are your college plans? What are you interested in? How did the rodeo go this weekend? We have found that to be a huge success. I've seen at the elementary level students go from fidgeting in seats and trying to pay attention to a teacher at a chalkboard to my kids coming home and being really engaged. Things as simple as flex seating, whether they get the benefit of sitting on an exercise ball instead of a 
traditional chair to help them focus in a different way, in a way that, that suits them. Our kids do still have a lot of social emotional needs. Doesn't matter the size of the community, there are gonna be kids who just have a rougher home life or maybe there are friend issues at school that need to be worked through. It doesn't matter the kids or where they live, all kids have social emotional issues, even if they have a wonderful home life. The idea of school families is that the kids that are involved in the school family are not all in the same class. The idea is spreading out across our entire school. So you have uh, varying ages from kindergarten all the way to sixth grade in a very small, tight-knit group with one adult that is the leader of that family, and we call it the family mom or the family dad. It creates a family structure here at school, especially for those kids who don't have a fantastic family structure at home. They have a place here at school where they belong, and somebody besides their teacher is checking on them and making sure they're okay and greeting them every day. My main concern is, are you coming to school safe? Are you coming to school ready to learn? Are you coming to school emotionally all right? I started here in 2014 as the maintenance director. I've worked doing that for the first two, three years. And then Randy Watson showed up at the auditorium. I was really excited about what Dr. Watson had to say. So I asked if I could be a part of it. I had some ideas about some technology art classes and they let me start a residential maintenance class. And this year we're doing residential maintenance business. My background is construction. I was running a construction company. When I worked in Topeka, kids would internship with me. And there was just things they wanted to know, but they didn't know and the schools didn't offer it. Residential maintenance was something that I know everybody's gonna get into at some point in their life. You're gonna own a home, you're gonna rent an apartment, you're gonna live someplace. I thought by doing a residential maintenance class where we teach the kids how to winterize their homes, how to fix a ceiling fan or replace a ceiling fan, fix holes in your drywall, fix your leaky faucet. You know, that's expensive to call somebody, but if you've got that background, you can do it yourself. It saves you money in the long run, and kids find it relevant, and they really like taking the class. Right now we're doing electrical. They've learned how to wire three-way switches, how to switch the switch out and know which wires go where. They know that they need to cut the breaker off. I've taught them how to use multimeters. They know those things now, and they can talk to you about them with knowledge. When we first started this, relevance was a big thing for us. We knew that probably 60% of the jobs that were out there are probably trade school jobs, and so we wanted to increase those roles. This year, it's told me they've come back, you know, over the summer in COVID, they've been locked in their homes, they couldn't go nowhere. Some of them have told me, you know, my doorknob dinged my wall in my bedroom, and my mom's been complaining about the big hole we have in our bathroom. And I've had two kids tell me that they've actually fixed those holes and painted them, and their mom and dad was pretty impressed by that. I was one of those kids who did well in school and I didn't have to put forth a ton of effort, but I wasn't willing to put forth a ton of effort either because I didn't really care. It wasn't my style of learning, but when I got into shop class, I loved it, that working with my hands. And it's not that I couldn't do the core work. I did fine with those, but the way they were taught, I wasn't engaged. I feel like we're addressing a lot of that for students and giving them opportunities to learn in a way that suits them. The more we can introduce them to those things in an environment where we can allow them to fail, brush them off, tell them, okay, what did we learn from this? Pick them up and give them the confidence to be willing to fail in the future when there's not someone there to pick them up. It allows for those students to explore those opportunities and decide, oh, maybe this is something I want to pursue, and maybe I need to pursue this at the collegiate level, or maybe I need to look towards a trade school. The first year we'd done a redesign, we traveled around to different schools all over. One of the schools we went to was in Omaha, and they were doing a flex mod schedule there. We talked to the teachers and the administration, and they couldn't say enough nice things about it. Teachers were saying, yeah, we're here a little later than normal, but we love it. Our BLT team and our rest of our teachers got together and we developed a flex mod schedule that would allow us to do more work study and job shadowing 
It would allow our technology arts and our facts classes to have more time. We started out with 40 minute mods. There was nine of them, I believe. And we broke them down into 20 minutes, uh, half mods. Some of the teachers, they teach for 20 minutes hard and then they let the kids go to the next class or a flex mod and then they do their work or their research and stuff there for their projects and then you might only meet three times a week with those kids. When we first started it, it was just chaos. The kids weren't used to having to pay attention to what they were doing during the day. Every day was something different. They might go here for 20 minutes and then they go here for 40. The kids really got better organizational skills. We taught them how to schedule things on their phones instead of just using them for FaceTime and, and Snapchat, they were actually using their calendars and their reminders on their phones. When you go to the Flex Room, you know what teachers are available to go talk to if you have homework, and it was up to them to make those appointments. It made the kids more accountable for their learning. So our schedule before, it was like, Monday at 8 a.m. you have math, and then Tuesday at 8 a.m. you have the same math class, and Wednesday at 8 a.m. you have math again. But now it's, I would call it more like a college schedule kind of. It's super flexible. Everyone has a completely different schedule each day from each other. Our flex scheduling, it's really opened up possibilities for a whole bunch of our student body. So it's kind of helping with career exploration before you get to college. I'm at work study at Lane Scott with the HVAC guy. It's giving me a head start to jump into college, learning stuff already, and it's helping me decide if I want to do this the rest of my life. I think it's good to explore trades because it's like backup, because if something goes wrong with what you're going into, you have the knowledge of already what you can go into. Well, it's good to have students that want to go into the trades now. You don't see that a whole lot anymore. I think they need to get them involved and keep them involved in it because, yeah, we definitely need more tradesmen. Eli's done real good this year. He's very willing to learn the job. He definitely wants to go into it. I couldn't ask for a better helper. I figured starting at a feedlot, I would learn stuff. Yeah, I've learned a lot from the feedlot as in like medicine-wise, but also like I fix a lot of things, I put mineral out, it's just everything, different stuff. So it's just like new experiences that I'm learning and why we're doing it. And this is the way we do it. I, if I wasn't doing this, I wouldn't be learning anything. I'd just probably still work inside. <laughs> Sadly, inside. <laughs> I want to work outside. An opportunity to be hands-on at something you think you want to do, turns out you didn't want to do before you sink $70,000 in education into it. Oh, I feel so fortunate. I mean, God put me on this earth to take care of cattle. I, I am one of the lucky ones that I get to do what I know I'm put here to do. And a lot of people don't. I want to be a wildlife conservationist, so I plan on working at an NRCS office. I'd like to be outside more, but when I'm old and fat, I'll be able to do office work <laughs> and I'll be able to go outside. So, you know, there's like a win-win situation. I don't have to always be outside in the crappy weather and I can also always go outside in the nice weather. So kind of a dream job. In farming, there's so many times where guys, when you ask them, why do you guys wean calves at a certain time? Well, that's how we've always done it, is often a response. I hate that response. <laughs> because while there's some validity and there's some element of that, what it's saying is there's comfort. That's what we're used to. And so helping people step beyond that is difficult, especially when, in the case of redesign, oftentimes there's a recognized lack of rigor. Pushing that up is going to be uncomfortable. And recognizing at the board level, at the administration level, at the teacher level, really across all levels, there's gonna be pushback. Our education is pretty near and dear to us, whether we like school or not. It's a big part of us. It's a big part of our upbringing. When we come in now and tell parents, essentially, the way you learned wasn't right, wasn't best practice, that can hit pretty hard. It can hit really close to home. And so helping them recognize that we're simply looking at our data. We're looking at our scores and our post-secondary success. And we're wanting to help our students do better. 
We're wanting kids to grow. We're wanting them to have opportunities that we didn't have. But I think one of the things that's important for us to do is to communicate to them, we're doing this because we believe it's best for kids. We don't want to just do the same practice. It is not easier on the teachers to be able to teach this way. It is harder on us. To turn the page and teach from a textbook is a lot smoother and, and a lot simpler than teaching to each individual student. I know some of the backlash here has been how much they're on technology, but what I want people to understand is that technology allows us to individualize their education. I'm a parent of three kids in this district, and I want that for them. So I hope people understand that technology is only a tool that we're using to help your kid be the best they can be. For me, redesign was a new approach, a new way of looking at things. So I was really, really excited to see education change, and I knew I wanted to be a part of that. We've moved away from that teacher-centered to student-centered and letting them lead the charge and letting them explore and find the answers the social-emotional part, the relationships that you build with kids through that type of learning is huge. One of the questions I get all the time is, when will we be done? And the answer is, never. Well, how will we know when it works? Well, we know it's working every single day because it is a process. This whole process has just made me feel confident that I'm in the right place. At the end of the day, day in and day out, it's just made my life better because I'm doing better for my students, which is rewarding for me. I feel fulfilled. The power of redesign is that you do have the ability to do what's best for your students in your school, in your community. From the very beginning, the first question that we always asked ourselves was, what's best for our kids? It's essential that each district not look to another district for the blueprint. There's no blueprint. Each community making it what it is for them, what they need, because what Coffeeville needs is very different than what Titan may be. We may have similarities, but we may have some vast differences as well. Investing in our community is vitally important and it doesn't matter what community you're in. Investing in your community and the longevity and health of it is vitally important, and I think that starts at the educational level. Those who are going into redesign or looking at getting a job at a redesign school, I would say, dive in. Just dive in. Try it. I didn't know how it was gonna go until I dove in, and now I won't go back. Will not. We're all familiar with individuals who excelled in school, but couldn't apply what they learned in the classroom to the real world, and struggled once they got out of school. And that's the, the positive thing about school redesign, is it moves the, the student closer to real world experience, motivating them, number one, and connecting their academic learning to the real world, and gets them thinking about what they actually want to do with their life once they get out. And I think the school redesign effort is a positive step in that direction uh, to look for new ways to educate students, to keep them involved, to motivate them to do better. And I think this is very positive and I'm happy it's happening here in Dighton.